Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks for uh, joining us today on the third quarter fiscal twenty three earnings call for Traction Technologies Limited. On behalf of uh, IFL Institutional Equities, I'd like to thank the management of Traction for giving us the opportunity to host this earnings call. Today we have with us um, uh, Neha Singh, co-founder, chairperson, and managing director; Abhishek Goel, co-founder, vice chairman, and executive director; and uh, Prashant Chandra, chief financial officer, with us. Uh, with that, I'll hand it over to uh, Neha and Abhishek to give their opening remarks, and we will then open it up for Q and A. Uh, please use the raise hand option to ask the question, or uh, you can also submit your questions in the Q and A box at the bottom of your screen. Thanks, and with that, uh, over to you, Neha. Thanks, Lord Rishi. Welcome, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today for our second earnings call. Uh, for the third quarter and the nine months which ended on December thirty first, twenty twenty two, we are very excited to present our results. Uh, in terms of the format, we would like to run through a short presentation and share some key highlights for the period. I will also give some commentary along, which will be helpful in the overall understanding, and we will follow that up with a Q and A session. Hope you are able to see the uh, the slide deck. I uh, request you to go through the standard disclaimer for this presentation. Quick recap on our business. Uh, Traction is a data and software platform for the private market globally. If you look at the public market, it has created multiple large companies, many of which are highly cash rich profitable companies. As private markets are becoming large and important, it will also create platforms like these. and we are building a global platform in this space our customers include venture capital funds private equity fund investment banks as well as mna teams and innovation teams in large fortune 500 corporations also it's a global platform so nearly 70% of our revenue is international and we have customers in over 50 countries i would like to first summarize uh, Uh, you know start by summarizing the financial performance for q3 of uh, of the current financial year just to note in our first analyst call on the bottom line side we had used adjusted ebitda and pat one feedback which we had received post our call was that the investors did not want to exclude the non cash expenses like the esop charge as these are ongoing cost of doing business and more broadly speaking they expected us to move to the raw bottom line numbers of ebitda and pat over time so we have incorporated this from the second earning call itself which is from this one onwards so in this deck we will be talking about ebitda and pat just to note this is no new information because we had already given these numbers as well as the comparence earlier so only thing which has changed is that in the narrative and in the charts when we talk about this we'll be referring to the ebitda and pat numbers a big thanks to also uh, you know some of our investors for this feedback and we would request it to please keep it coming to set the context we have one business one legal entity so you'll not see terms like stand alone or consolidated all the numbers that i'll talk about is for the business overall the revenue from operations for q3 fy23 was 20.3 crores which is a 23% year on year increase total income was 21 crores which is a 25% year on year increase this is the annualized run rate of 84 crores coming to profitability ebitda was 0.8 crores just to add this ebitda includes all the non cash expense like the esop charge as well pat for the same period was 1.4 crores just to note uh, the pat that you will see in the financials is 6.2 crores because this also includes an extraordinary item of 4.8 crores reimbursement of the ipo expense to the company so this was expensed in the previous quarters and reimbursed to the company in the last quarter so the pat and the ebitda numbers that you will see in this as well as the subsequent slide is only adjusted for this ipo reimbursement moving on the ebitda margin was 3.9% and the pat margin was 7.1%. The other interesting aspect is that the business also generates free cash flow which has been increasing. 
In the first nine months of FY23, the business generated positive free cash flow of 7.8 crores, which is an increase of 149% on an year on year basis. Cash and cash equivalent stood at 55.4 crores, which is an increase of 27% on an year on year basis, or an increase of 11.7 crores in absolute terms on an year on year basis. So in this quarter, we saw continued revenue growth, investments in growth initiatives, and continued increase in free cash flow as well as cash and cash equivalents. To summarize the YTD numbers for all the financials for the first nine months of the current financial year, the revenue from operations was 57.8 crores, which is a 25% increase on an year-on-year -year basis. Total income was 60.1 crores, which is a 27% increase on an year-on-year -year basis. In terms of profitability, EBITDA was 1.9 crores for the same period. PAT was 4.1 crores for the first nine months. Again, the PAT that you will see in the financials is higher of about 8.6 crores because it includes IPO expense, which was previously expensed and reimbursed to the company in the last period. So the EBITDA and the PAT number that you'll see in this slide, as well as in the subsequent slides, have been adjusted only for this reimbursement. Uh, just to note, this bottom line number that you see includes all the non-cash expenses as well. Uh, moving on, uh, the EBITDA margin was 3.2% and the PAT margin was 7.1%. In the subsequent slides, I'll be covering each of these metrics that we talked about in the summary slide in more detail, starting with revenue. Revenue from operations is essentially revenue from platform subscriptions. So 100% of our revenue is subscription-based. There is no services or one-time implementation component. So that's a fairly high quality revenue. Also, please note that this is the accrued revenue. Right. So though we do prepaid billing and collections like most other financial data platforms that you might have used, we only recognize revenue for the time duration falling within the reporting period for which the services were made available. As discussed earlier, the revenue from operations for the first nine months of FY23 was 57.8 crores, which is a 25% year-on-year increase. Total income was 60.1 crores, which is a 27% increase which is, I've also given uh, the uh, historical data for the last three financial year for reference here. Uh, moving on, EBITDA for the first nine months was 1.9 crores. If you exclude the non-cash ESOP expense, this was 5.7 crores. Okay? We are just giving it because we had given the split also earlier. Uh, this 1.9 crore EBITDA is an, incre is an increment of 3.6 crores on a year-on-year -year basis. That is from a negative 1.7 crores to positive 1.9 crore. In terms of margin, the EBITDA margin for the first nine months was 3.2%. This is an expansion of 7% on a year-on-year -year basis. So this continues to be an interesting aspect that you see in our business, which is the margin expansion that happens. On similar lines, PAT for the first nine months was 4.1 crores. If you exclude the non-cash ESOP expense, this was eight crores of PAT for the first nine months. Uh, this 4.1 crore of PAT is an increment of 4.8 crore on an year-on-year -year basis. That is from a negative 0.7 crore to positive 4.1 crore. In terms of the margin, the PAT margin for the first nine months was 7.1%. This is an expansion of 8.6% on an year-on-year -year basis. One of the key reasons for the margin expansion is that significant portion of the incremental revenue goes into the bottom line. To be specific, if you look at revenue from operations from the, for the first nine months of this year, and compared to the same period last year, we added incremental revenue of 11.5 crores, out of which 32% or 3.6 crore went into incremental EBITDA. Again, this is not one off. Even if you look at the last two years from FY 20 to 21, 84% of the incremental revenue from operations went into increased EBITDA. From FY 21 to 22, 77% of the incremental revenue from operations went into incremental EBITDA. So to summarize, since the cost to serve incremental customer is limited, 
a significant portion of the incremental revenue goes into bottom line. The exact percentage of this varies across the different periods, primarily based on the investments done across various growth initiatives during these periods. Coming to expenses, our total expense for the first nine months of FY23 was 56 crores. This is the 16% increase over the previous year. If you see, this is higher than what you had seen in the previous year, right? because of some of the growth initiatives that were undertaken during this period. Uh, we believe that these will help us accelerate revenue growth in future by helping us expand our sales effort as well as penetration within certain customer segments. I will also cover these initiatives in detail in the subsequent slides. On the right hand side of this slide, uh, we have also given the breakup of the expense across the key components. The key components are the same as what you had seen previously. Just to summarize, first is that bulk of the expense is team cost. So for the same period, 88% of the total expense was team cost, which has been in the same range across the last two years as well. So in FY21 and 22, this was 88% and 89% respectively of the total expense. Also to note, all our team is in-house. There is no outsourced or contract workforce that we have. The second largest line item is cloud hosting, which accounted for 3.4% of the total expense. As we do a lot of data processing and analytics, so this is one, large, uh, one significant cost head that we have. This is followed by rental expense. The other interesting aspect uh, is that we do not have a large uh, paid marketing expense line item because we do not have a large paid marketing spend, neither digital nor offline, which is typically required for customer acquisition. The reason for this is that because we are a data company, we produce a lot of content and hence are able to use it to get a lot of organic traffic. So we are able to acquire leads fairly efficiently, which is reflected in our expense breakup. So I wanted to take a couple of minutes to cover some of the growth initiatives and other initiatives which I referred to in the previous slide. So one interesting initiative on the data side is that we are expanding financials and captable data sets of private companies on platform. Uh, for instance, financial and captables is uh, one of the data points that we have for private companies among many other data sets. And uh, today we cover financials of private companies across 15, uh, over 15 countries and cap tables in, uh, of companies in over 10 countries. Uh, these data sets are particularly in demand by certain customer segments like private equity and investment banking among other segments. Just to give an illustration, an investor is looking to scan an upcoming space like a single speciality hospital chain or a T2C or an internet first brand. Brands. Uh, in a particular country, then in addition to seeing interesting companies and market landscape, they would also like to see, find out the ones which have, say, crossed 50 crore of revenue scale. So since we now generate sufficient cash flows, we have invested across this initiative where we basically increase the throughput across these data engines. Uh, we believe that this will help us accelerate revenue growth in future, particularly in customer segments like private equity and investment banking. Another interesting uh, growth initiative is press mentions. Uh, we ideally want that whenever media, be it print or digital, is talking about data about private markets or startup landscape or innovation landscape, they should quote data from traction. This gives us a lot of brand mentions in a very relevant and targeted customer segment. So for this, we have done multiple initiatives like launch reports with media, do data contributions, uh, we have also signed up regular columns in some newspapers, etc. Right? So this has resulted in multifold increase in the press mentions that we got across various respected media outlets. And we believe that this goes a long way in building a brand as a data company. And also it helps our sales conversion and hence our revenue growth. Scaling of the inside sales team spanning various geographies. So this is one initiative that we had talked about earlier. And since we now have good set of referenceable customers across various countries, 
and have good lead pipeline. We have scaled the sales team also, which spans across various regions, which is basically inside sales, but they cover various regions. Just to note, most of the scale up that we had planned to do in this team this year has been already done. Another minor point is that, like most companies, we are also encouraging more and more of our team members to start working from office. We had expanded office capacity for this during this period, which has led to some uh, increase in rental and other overhead costs. So to add bulk of the increments which is needed for these initiatives, be it on the team size increase or the or the seat capacity increase or the rental increase, is already done. Uh, we have seen, we, the other thing is that we have also seen that these initiatives are typically followed by an optimization phase, either through process or people optimization or through automation. We believe that this should also contribute to increased revenue momentum in future. Uh, also, we expect bulk portion of the incremental revenue to continue going back to the bottom line within the next two to three quarters. Uh, moving on, interestingly, despite these investments in various growth and other initiatives, the company generated positive increasing free cash flow and also increased cash and cash equivalence, both on an year on year as well as on a sequential quarter on quarter basis. The company generated free cash flow of 7.8 crores in the first nine months or FY23, which is a 149% increase or an increase of 4.7 crores over the same period last year. Cash and cash equivalence ended at 55.4 crores, which is an increase of 11.7 crores on a year on year basis. We've also added uh, the data on the free cash flow in the last three years. And you can see that this has been consistently increasing across the last two years as well. In the subsequent three slides, we, come up, we cover some of the other KPIs that we also track closely for our business. On the first slide, we covered the number of customer accounts, number of user accounts. So we closed December 22 at uh, 1187 accounts and 3,391 users, uh, both of which were 15% year-on-year increase. In terms of other KPIs, contract price or the invoicing amount for the first nine months or FY23 was nearly 60 crores, which is a 20% increase over the same period last year. The last graph talks about the number of entities profile, which is a proxy to the amount of data that we added on the platform. So today we track more than 2 million profiles, including private market companies, funds, etc. globally. In terms of some other interesting characteristics, so 68% of the revenue in the first nine months of the current financial year was from outside India. If you look at it, this has been in the same range of about 70% across the last three financial years as well. These customers span over 50 countries. Uh, the top five countries within this show a similar spread to where you have the large corporates as well as private market investors. Uh, the top five countries for us by number of customer accounts are US, India, UK, Singapore, Germany. This covers most of the key updates from the recent period. I will also take a few minutes to summarize some of the key aspects of our business. Quick recap on our journey. We launched the platform in FY13. Over the time, we have expanded our offering as well as the global footprint of customers. We got listed on NSE and BSE last year. We enjoy a significant cost advantage due to the cost arbitrage of make in India and sell globally. The cost advantage is primarily due to three key reasons. First, though we have global data and data on companies across countries, our entire data production and technology platform is built from India. Secondly, though we have customers in over 50 countries, our entire sales primarily happens from India over video calls like these. Thirdly, we don't spend much on paid marketing, both digital as well as offline as a means to acquire customer. Because we are a data company, we are able to do a lot of content marketing to acquire customers organically. Hence, we believe these things give us a significant and a long-lasting cost advantage. Another key aspect is our experienced board and team. We have had a formal board for over five years, which has ensured that the company has been fairly high on compliance as well as corporate governance. 
we have had pwc as the auditor for the last 7 years with no qualifications across all these years apart from the promoter we have had vivek mathur from elevation as an investor nominee and we have four independent directors uh, which bring in very rich experience of having worked across various large corporates as well as private market funds in terms of our team we have a fairly built out and strong senior management team across vps avps cxos apart from that we were fortunate to have got the backing of marquee set of investors during our journey as a private company as well as in our ipo process a key aspect of our business is a very robust scalable and automated technology platform which is essential in building a global data platform uh, at the back end we track millions of companies we use big data machine learning to mine large data sets and bubble up new interesting companies every day and we continue to invest across this technology infrastructure lastly one very interesting aspect is that we play in a very large and growing market if you look at public market it has created multiple large billion dollar plus revenue companies accumulatively uh, these companies generate over 3 uh, 30 billion dollar of revenues annually and most of these companies are fairly profitable companies as well as generate large amount of free cash flow uh, private markets have also becoming large today for instance the private market aum has crossed 9 trillion dollars globally according to industry report hence it will also create large data platforms and this is the space that we play in uh subsequently we have some slides uh, with the detailed financial statements which people can go through in more detail um uh, thanks that's all the key points that i had to cover i will pass it back to rishi for any q and a that the group might have yeah thanks neha thanks for uh, the presentation uh, i would like to now request uh, um the audience to please uh, raise their hands in case they have uh, uh, any questions uh, um, or you can also put it in the q and a uh, box uh, right at the bottom of your screen um the first question is from uh, bhargav buddhadev um, uh, please uh, go ahead hello Yes, but can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Yes. So my first question is, um, uh, if you can uh, let us know what has been the ESOP related expense in the quarter, um, so that um, we get a comparable EBITDA growth number. Because in the presentation, the uh, EBITDA growth number looks very low because uh, I guess uh, it's not comparable on a YY basis. Right. Um. so the is uh, i will probably uh, pass it to prashant to give the uh, the esop expense for the uh, for this quarter yeah so uh, so for the quarter the esop expense was about 1.3 for crores so the 5% yy growth which you've written in the presentation uh, uh, for the third quarter on ebitda um, if you adjust for the esop related spend how much would it be Okay, okay. Because I guess in this quarter you have ESOP spend which was missing in the same quarter last year, right? No, so we would have ESOP uh, spend across all the quarters. Yeah, I'll probably uh, Prashant you can. Yeah, so the ESOP expense was also in the you know the uh, the quarter previous year as well. I think it was uh, more in the range of about eighty uh, lakhs or so. And this count is one point three four crores. So for both the year for the year in August, ESOP expenses increased. So it's mainly because of the ESOP related spend that the EBITDA growth on a YY basis looks lower, right? Uh, so that and also there are some like you know uh, in terms of the indicators yeah. that they had been spent. So there was some team increase which has increased to uh, contributed mm -hmm. to the increase in the employee year. yeah so i'll just add to this so basically the way to look at it esop expenses uh, for us uh, esop is not one off 
uh, you will not find uh, you know sort of a, a, a bulk grant or anything that is done uh, it is it is sort of a part of the appraisal process so instead of so we don't have a cash bonus for instance in place uh, for the employees and in instead of that you actually give part of the uh, appraisal as esop so the uh, esop is a percentage of your uh, total employee expense you know that has probably been in the same range and that you uh, in across the quarters so that is one on the esop cost uh, the second thing is that uh, the um, uh, the, uh, the basically the ebitda margin that you see that is based on some of the uh, like growth initiatives that we talked about uh, which has happened in during this period which would have contributed to how much of the incremental revenue has you know contributed to incremental ebitda in this period Hope that answers secondly, the question, Matha. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Secondly, uh, uh, are the new ESOPs also going to be issued at at uh, uh, face value? Because now that we are listed company, uh, just wanted to check uh, if the incremental ESOPs will also be uh, issued at uh, face value. Right. So just to say the ESOP uh, ESOP pool and uh, it, so it's the same as what is there, uh, what was there in the DRHP. We have not created any. new esop pool uh, post listing so it's the right. uh, so, so the recent one was basically the same one which was there in the drhp which was you know there pre ip as well so it's just the same esop pool which is there uh, the second in terms of uh, the um, the strike price so that is uh, that, that is actually going to be in the same policy so that is uh, so that is for instance 1 rupee uh, and the way to think about our, it is basically when we give so for instance a person is having a salary of say 15 lakh and when we are giving a part of their appraisal say you know 1 to 1.5 lakh in esop so it is basically given in cash terms right so basically you know whatever esop worth of uh, 1 to 1 uh, 1.5 lakh is given as esop so the actual strike price does not matter because uh, you know it will be converted based on what is the uh, what's the uh, what's the value of that so okay. that answers the question ma'am Yeah, it does answer. It's just that we as shareholders get diluted, <laughs> so uh, that's the only reason. No problems. Uh, this is this is, this is, this is, this is but Sorry? this is no new pool. This is the same pool that was already that there earlier. Yeah, but number of shares do increase, right? Once the ESOP gets vested. Yes. Yeah. So coming to coming to your uh, uh, customer and user growth, uh, it's been now at about fifteen percent Y O I during the quarter. Uh, this number looks uh, a tad on the lower side, given that um, uh, we were highlighting that it's a huge market opportunity. So why is the uh, user count or the customer count growing at just about fifteen percent on a Y O I basis? Is it that we need to now spend on paid marketing, or uh, how should we accelerate this growth number? Right. So coming to the customer growth. So if you look at it, the customer growth is uh, is fifteen percent. But if you look at the the uh, the correct maybe to look at actually the revenue growth. So that has been if you look at the last across the last three quarters, it has been. Uh, so uh, you know, like twenty three percent, twenty eight percent, twenty three percent. So that is probably the uh, the uh, the right thing to look at it because the ASP has also been changing. If you look at the it, the ASP has actually increased. Uh, so from the last financial year, the ASP was six point five lakh. If you look at the recent quarter, it's just six point nine lakh. Right. So there's also growth which has happened in terms of the uh, account size. Right. So I think the right thing to look at it is basically uh, on the uh, the, rev- the revenue growth because the ASP has also been expanding in the same period. Right, that is one. A uh, second thing on the customer acquisition. So uh, so I don't think we uh, currently have uh, need to move to paid marketing. Actually, there's a lot of uh, top of the funnel that we are seeing in the existing channels that we are working on uh, through a lot of content marketing, through a lot of uh, you know public pages, or through a lot of other things that we are doing on the partnership front etc uh, so we see a lot of uh, you know sort of leads which is there and that is also one of the reasons that we have also scaled the sales team because we are seeing sufficient leads across different geographies which we are actively working on okay great i'll come back in the queue uh, and all the very best
Uh, anyone um, who wants to directly ask a question, please raise your hand. In the meantime, I'm going to yeah. um, just uh, uh, put forward some of the questions uh, that have come in the Q&A box. Um, so the first one is uh, from Pratyush Agarwal. Uh, what is the positive USD impact on revenues, contract price, QOQ, and YY? Uh, I believe this would this refers to the forex impact, uh, right, on the revenue growth. So just to uh, actually summarize, we haven't given the uh, the split of the revenue growth across uh, forex or existing or new. Uh, maybe we'll give that uh, you know on a, a later time. But just to uh, get a sense on how forex impacts our business. So uh, one is that the forex does not uh, if the currency uh, depreciates or if you know the, the forex becomes more favorable it is not that it is going to have impact on just one quarter for us uh, because the way we book the forex rate is based on the day that the uh, the customer was billed so for instance if i uh, if i have a, a customer who is paying me annual upfront and if i raise an invoice for them today uh, it will be booked on the exchange rate as on today and we will accrue that revenue over the next four quarters based on the based on the forex rate that existed today. That is one. So similarly, even in the current quarter, we would have some part of the uh, some part of the revenue which we would have converted at forex rate, which would have existed, you know, three quarters back, for instance, right? So the impact of the uh, so if, for instance, the uh, you know the the rupee depreciates. Uh, we do get the benefit, but the benefit will not be just in this quarter. It will be, you know, part of it will also flow into the subsequent quarters. Okay. Um, the next question comes from uh, Vivek Setia. Uh, Vivek, go ahead. Hi. Thanks, Rishi. Uh, good evening, Neha. So uh, I had a couple of questions, firstly, with regards to, I mean, I have some data keeping questions mainly. Um, the first is if you could give your employee breakup for uh, this quarter and the previous quarter as well, in particular, the sales uh, strength, sales team strength. Sure. So we had uh, given the court, uh, the breakup of the employee cost as of uh, end of uh, June, we plan to give it probably also by the end of Q4. Um, but the broad head, if I were to break up of about 800 people that we had at that time, uh, so about 440 is on analyst data operations. Uh, these are people that work across various data teams, um, you know, modules like financials, cap tables, transactions, company data, sector focus analyst team, et cetera. Then we have an 81 member product and technology team, which is across engineering as well as product. Then we have a 220 member team uh, across sales, marketing, and customer success. So this is your GPM team, which works across the entire funnel, from top of the funnel being marketing, sales, and as well as customer success, which helps in onboarding as well as customer expansion. And then there were 59 people that worked in business support. So uh, Hope that can you provide us with the latest numbers for the sales team for the uh, for this quarter as well as for the previous quarter? the strength of the sales team so we haven't given that breakup but uh, my sense is that that uh, that the team strength the sales team's uh, strength would have crossed 150 at the end of this q3 okay and uh, what are the total number of employees uh, of about more than uh, more than eight about 850 plus so it's same as the last quarter uh, but no, there is growth even from Q2 end that you see to Q3, there is actually growth in this team as well. So it, okay. on a sequential basis, Q2 to Q3, the headcount has increased and primarily in these two teams. So one is your uh, the team that covers this data point, which is financials and cap tables. And the second one is the sales team. Okay. Okay. And uh, secondly, I wanted to understand your uh, user to customer account ratio. So what I see is there are 32 customer accounts that have been added during the quarter and 26 users that have been added during the quarter. So like, and prior to that, like whatever historical data that has been provided, the ratio has been around three, like for every customer account, there are three users. So if you could explain this addition in this quarter, like, um, yeah. Right. 
right so the uh, user account would be from two uh, ways one is basically growth in the existing customers and the other one is basically new customers that get onboarded if you look at it bulk a lot of the customers uh, a lot of the users would be from the existing accounts which would have grown so hence there would be a difference between these two no so uh, if you have onboarded say for example in this quarter you have onboarded 32 customers so just uh, on a like just right. on a comparable basis of like right. 3 to 1 the ratio that is you that usually has prevailed over the prior quarters like shouldn't there be an addition of 96 to 100 users uh, in this quarter like why only 26 right so this can be because of two reasons one is basically so every customer you know has uh, probably uh, you know some user to begin with plus second is that there might be some uh, change in the users that would have happened in the existing base as well so like i think they would that have reduced the account. they would have reduced yes that okay. might be one uh, this thing or the second thing is that if someone buys uh, uh, you know we also have a package which is api package so there the number of users would be high so the asp is fairly high, uh, high the number of users would be low okay and um in this breakup that you've provided like 68 percent of the total revenues come from international uh like outside india could you uh more specifically give out some more details like uh how many are these are how many of these are coming from say the america's region and uh others because uh the breakup that you had provided in your uh rhp and drhp according to that if i see the realization uh, the realization from Americas and other international countries are uh, far higher in comparison to uh, that of India. So if you could provide that uh, sub subset of international revenues wherein how much is from Americas and how much is from other countries. Right, right. So, uh, so in terms of the revenue, you're right, like, uh, you know, 68% is, uh, is international and the remaining is India. Uh, out of this, by revenue, US is the largest out of this, uh, which at the uh, in the last financial year accounted for 27% and followed by EMEA and rest of APAC. Uh, my sense is that uh, we'll, we will give that split again at the end of this year. Uh, that split would have varied marginally, not a lot. That's one. The second point is actually correct. So the realization of international is actually higher. So if you look at the ASP, on an overall basis, it is 6.9 lakh. Uh, but if you compare the India and the international, the international is nearly 1.5 times. Uh, yeah, the realized price right. is 1.5 times than what it is there for India. So that is yeah. correct. That is a function of uh, you know uh, how much users typically these customers end up buying, and hence the pricing for that as well. So yes, that is uh, you know slightly higher. But th that split has probably uh, you'll, uh, you know should probably be in the similar range. Across okay. regions, and uh, just wanted to understand about this uh, reversal of the IPO expenses that you have done in the PNL. Could you uh, explain, like, what is that actually? Because I couldn't understand what is that. Sure. So, uh, so as part of the IPO, uh, because uh, you know, uh, because it was an OFS, uh, you know, IPO, then the entire expense had to be paid by the selling shareholders. So part of the uh, expense is basically expensed by the company initially and reimbursed to the company on successful completion of the IPO based on the shareholder agreement, which is there. And this is actually directly done from the escrow account itself. So, you know, when the, uh, the IPO proceeds come directly from the es escrow account itself, this uh, basically the reimbursement happens. So we, uh, like last quarter, we had anyways talked about even the numbers that we had given last quarter was basically taking this into account because we were expecting the reversal to happen in the next few months. And that has happened in this period. So it is basically you should look at the EBITDA and the PAC number net of that because this is a one-off sort of expense and the reimbursement that has happened. Okay. And uh, uh, just one more thing on the operating leverage side of things because um, I see that, you know, excluding this uh, reversal of uh, IPO expenses, the uh, incremental EBITDA margin has come down to 32%. So, uh, whereas it was 60 and 70% in the first two quarters of this year. So, uh, like, how do we see this going forward? Like, uh, right. yeah. Right, right. No, no. So, that's an interesting question. And this is, I think, uh, what is also interesting in our business that, you know, we should ideally expect that bulk of the incremental revenue should, uh, you know, continue going in the bottom line. Uh, there has been minor, so for instance, uh, you know, some of the growth initiatives that we have done, which we have talked about, uh, which have led to some cost inc increment. That is why you saw this 
you know come uh, as 32 percent and uh what uh you know as as uh, as also mentioned that basically you know it should normalize in the next one to two quarters and we can expect bulk of the incremental revenue which is more than you know uh, ideally 50 percent to continue to go into the bottom line right and just on that point so despite sort of these initiatives that we have done uh both on a sequential as well as uh you know on a year-on-year basis the cash and cash equivalents have increased and you know the free cash flow has sort of increased could you uh, explain a bit more about those initiatives right so these are uh, the couple of the ones that i talked about so one is basically investment in uh, data so for instance uh, from from some of the customer segments like private equity and investment bank one of the requests that we used to get is you know a uh, request for financials and cap tables we think that investing in this will help us go more deeper into these customer segments as well as increase our sales conversion in these customer segments so this is sort of one initiative that we have done so uh, what that means is basically the, the the number of the coverage of financials that we have across 15 countries of uh, over 15 countries uh, across these data points we will increase that within this year that's one the second thing which we talked about in the last call which is just a continuation which is the expansion of the sales team and third were minor operational things so for instance you know like your rental increase and uh, increase in some of the other uh, expenses which has happened which is uh, sort of more operational also in nature um just just one more question i'll ask so as you said that you know have expanded your sales team apart from just expanding the strength of your sales team what are you uh, planning to do or what are you doing you know to uh, in you know uh, promote your business like say for example if you see pitchbook pitchbook has been doing uh, sales and marketing expenses uh, whereas we see in our uh, pnl the, the expense is negligible the promotional expenses are negligible so just wanted to understand apart from you know uh, like just to uh, understand apart from increasing the sales strength uh, like what else are we doing you know to promote our platform Right. No. So that is uh, um, actually uh, actually. Uh, so we are doing actually a lot of things on the GTM front. So if you look at the life cycle of our company, uh, you know we are in the tenth year. The first five to six years were disproportionate investment in technology, building the data platform, etc. Because you know that's the core IP of a data company. If you look at it in the last couple of years, uh, more investment has gone, or more uh, initiatives have been in the on the GTM front as well. Like even if you look at in the team size increase, the expenses that have sort of uh, increased. That are uh, a lot in the GTM side as well, and we continue to be actually, you know, do a lot of uh, things on that front. Just to give an idea, you know, on the top of the funnel, we have a uh, you know very large sort of uh, organic, uh, you know, leads pipeline, which gives us a uh, lot of organic leads every month and every day. Uh, we have over uh, you know uh, like thousand plus uh, you know press mentions, which has been there. Uh, we have uh, you know uh, n- newsletters that we do. We have partnerships in. Uh, in some of the countries, right, uh, for uh, generating leads uh, across corporate as well as private market investors across all these, uh, you know, geographies. So that's one on the top of the funnel. The second thing is the sales conversion, which is where the sales team comes in, which is, you know, they basically do demos uh, over video calls and close the account. So that's the second funnel. Plus, there's also uh, work that is going on in the customer success team right which is basically uh, helpful in onboarding and growing the accounts so for instance even if you look at the asp you know that has increased marginally uh, the number of accounts that we see the large accounts for instance which are say more than 40 lakh you know that has also increased so there's a lot of work which is being done across all the uh, you know parts of the funnel okay okay thank you Mia. thank you so much thank you next question is from uh, amit chandra amit uh, please go ahead uh yeah hi neha and uh, uh, thanks for the opportunity so my uh, no my question is on continuation with uh, what we were asking so you know we have a fairly large sales team uh, you know uh, if i see our revenues compared to that we have a fairly large you know, sales team and we have done the investments uh, you know, over the last 3 years so what uh, uh, steps we are taking to uh, you know increase the sales efficiency uh, and also you know in terms of the you know uh, the, the current sales team or the current employee base what kind of revenues uh, you know you know like this employee base or this sales team can actually generate right over the next like 3 to 4 years so that's a more long term question and uh, uh, also in terms of uh, our inquiries to conversion ratio how it has uh, panned over the last uh, 
you know maybe one year because i know uh, like last year was a very good year in terms of uh, you know like investments from, from the private equity side but this year the investments have been very very muted and as compared to last year so what uh, you know uh, what impact we have seen uh, you know based on the conversions and also in terms of pricing how we are different uh, from the competition maybe from a pitch book or you know the other players were there sure so sure, thanks anath i'll just take up uh, you know some of these so one is on the sales uh, part so uh, on the sales i i think efficiency this is something that you know we do sort of track very closely i, I think li- right now a lot of work is also being done on this increasing the top of the funnel which is just getting more leads to the so the to the team so uh, that is why you know you would typically have uh the sales team uh you know some bulk of our closure actually happens through inbound wherein the customer has already seen some of the content is familiar with you know uh, some output and then we are able to convert the customer more easily uh so a lot of the effort is also you know going on in both of these things which is basically you know how do you increase uh, the continue to sort of increase the top of the funnel as well as continue to maintain the conversion efficiency that you have seen in the sales team right so that is one on the uh, on the sort of the sales part uh the second is how large can uh, will we require so currently i think we have probably uh, you know done most of the hiring that we require in the sales team for the next you know at least this calendar year we don't foresee uh, much more increase in capacity within this team i think this team can sufficiently deliver the growth that you know we have planned uh, so that's one on the uh, on the uh, on the how large can it become uh, coming to the uh the the second question which is you know how has the funding winter impacted conversion so interestingly we haven't seen a lot of impact on the conversion so our conversion what it was there earlier uh, it has probably remained in the same range the way we measure conversion is if we give a demo to a customer how with what percentage is they are they able to convert so that has you know remained in the uh, that has probably decreased marginally but you know uh, not significantly uh so there is a little bit of impact which is there on the slowdown overall because last year obviously for you know for instance um uh, if you look at the last year's growth versus this three quarters growth you know there's a little bit of slowdown which is there but there's no incremental you know additional impact that we see within this right so that is one on the uh, on the conversion side coming to the last one which is on the pricing so currently if you look at uh, our average pricing per account is uh, i think the more comparable is the average realized pricing per user so for us it is about 2.4 lakh uh, per year per user uh, if you compare it to some of the other platforms it is probably higher by uh, one and a half times uh, but not sort of very high there are uh, you know some data platforms which is very shallow which is probably 1/10 our pricing uh, but we are probably you know we fall in the mid price point segment i would say Yeah. No. So, you uh, know, uh, you know, the competitor which is much larger in size, maybe thirty to forty times bigger than us. So, on that base, they are able to grow thirty-five, forty percent, and they have a user base which is much larger than we have, and we are almost competing in the same market, which is the international market. Uh, so, you know, uh, so is it the platform that makes a difference, or is it their, you know, deep pockets? in which they are doing a lot of you know, promotional activity that is uh you uh, know uh, that is the you know differentiating factor or is it the parentage or you know it's a part of morning star so that is uh, you know the major differentiator so right right so just to address that so i think the uh, the large the uh, the continuous sort of growth that is uh, that that you know this market is also seeing in terms of the players so that's just a testimony to the fact that you know how deep the market is uh so you know that just shows that you know like private markets have become sizable so that's you know that's sort of interesting to see uh coming to the second point you know what you know what is the difference so i think there is uh in terms of the data there's probably little difference i would say. i mean th- there's a little bit of head start that they have you know obviously people have because of some years but i think the more uh, in impa- the more effort that we see is on the gtm front which is you know how many customers actually have seen our content or know or uh, you know know about us or yeah you know know about uh, the data that we have across different industries and as well as you know how is the conversion and how are we able to work with the customers for the ongoing expansion 
I think there is a lot more juice that we see in this front. And that is why, you know, and that's the natural evolution also of a data company. Like, you know, initially you have to sort of invest a lot in this. And, you know, subsequently, wherein you have uh, sort of referenceable customers across all these geographies, you can then double down on your, uh, all the GTM initiatives, which is what we have been also doing. So I think uh, I see that more of a difference in the GTM front, which is where we also spending, uh, you know, a lot of effort in terms of the initiatives that we are doing. Okay, thank you, Naya, and all the best. Thanks, Thanks Amit. Uh, the next question is from uh, Samir Dosani. Yeah, am I audible? Yeah. Yeah, so my question was also uh, regarding the slide 11, the, uh, you know, 36, 32% uh, incremental EBITDA was the, uh, the revenue that we have added. So <clears throat> clearly this, uh, you know, this is reverse of the trend that we have seen in the last few quarters because of the additional investments. So now that it is in the base, how should we think about this ratio going right. forward? Right, right. So I think this was more of a, uh, I would say this was, uh, if you look at, you know, also the uh, the cost impact, this was little higher than what we would have seen on the normalized basis. And that's why we also talked about some of the other Sort of initiatives we did. So on a state, on a more normalized, uh, uh, you know, state, you can actually uh, expect this to increase. The percentage of incremental revenue going into bottom line should increase, and that we should start expecting to see in the within the next uh, two to three quarters. We expect that you know this will again become to uh, you know come back to bulk of the revenue getting added to bottom line. Sure, and, and, that and, the question. and yeah. yeah, yeah. So so majority of the initiatives are in the base now, is it? Yes, yes. So if I were okay. to say, uh, you know, uh, like a majority of the increment that we had to do in terms of the headcount, etc., the most of it is done. So, sure. Okay, okay. And and if I look at your customer addition, it has after being weak last quarter or last few, uh, you know, H one has started increasing. So how should we understand? You know, the market is easing in terms of adding adding new customers. How should we think about this thing? So in terms of the, uh, uh, you mean to say like, how does the, uh, how, how are we seeing in the market, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. What is the market outlook for, yeah. how is it? How right, is, yeah. right. So in terms of the market, obviously, if you compare to 2021 level, there's a little bit of slowdown, which is there and which is also factored in the, the numbers. For instance, last year, we grew at 45%. This year, if you look at the last three quarters, it has been close to 25%. So this is already something that we have factored in. Going forward, we don't see any incremental sort of impact. We actually see probably things getting better from what we are seeing in terms of the new customers, uh, which is which we are working with, or the conversions that we are seeing, or thirdly, even in the expansion with the existing accounts that we are seeing. Right. So, for instance, a good um, uh, uh, indicator of this is, for instance, you know, the the ASP is actually increased in, during this period as well. Uh, so that's just a factor that, you know, you can actually grow within the existing accounts. So it's not that people are sort of cutting back a lot. So there is obviously a little bit of impact which is there, but this has already been factored in the last three quarters. And, you know, uh, probably we see things to be, uh, you know, like getting better. It can be because of two things. Uh, one is, uh, though, if you look at the private market, though there's a little bit of slowdown, but the private market funds, if you look at it, they are sitting on an all-time high dry powder. Right. So though they might be a bit slow in deploying this year, they will probably end up deploying in the next two to three years. Right? So that is one on the private market side. And the second thing is that, you know, we are a small uh, percentage of the market, like a single digit percentage of the market. So, you know, we are also able to grow within that. Right? So uh, I think based on that, we see, you know, it's to be uh, probably, uh, you know, staying uh, the market to be staying the current or probably in increasing. Understood. Thanks. And how has the churn rate changed in last few quarters? Is that increased? If you can provide some commentary around that, that would be great, helpful. Thanks. Sure. So in terms of the churn rate, we have given only the annual one and we'll, uh, you know, we have given the annual one, which is about 74%, which is how many accounts uh, by number, which, which were due for renewal uh, within this year in the annualized basis and how much end up, uh, you know, renewing. Um, we haven't given the updated ones on a quarterly basis. We'll probably add some more metrics when we do the annual roundup. Uh, but uh, my sense is that this is uh, there might be some difference in it, but uh, uh, it may not have changed uh, a lot. It, there might be some difference from last year to this year, but it may not, not have changed. Uh, so I don't have the exact number for this. Maybe we'll give these numbers you know, when we do the annual roundup. Sure, sure, sure. And and and. 
and just a book keeping question 1.3 crore is the uh, run rate we should expect from the ease of expenses or, or should we expect this increasing in the next few quarters so the way you can look at the ease of that as a percentage of your total employee expense would probably remain in the same range so uh, okay. if you look at it historically it has remained between 7 to 8% or around okay. that range and you can expect okay. it to remain as a in a similar range so we sure. we, are, we don't plan to give or we haven't historically given like a one time lump sum kind of ease of or anything it's just a part of the or salary we don't give cash bonus so part of it is actually given in this form sure okay okay that's it from my side thanks all the best thanks um, sami next question is from uh, pratyush agarwal uh, pratyush please go ahead hi uh, hi neha and uh, abhishek uh, can you hear me yes we can hear you right yeah so so neha just uh, two questions uh, so one one uh, i see this uh, enterprise wide access plan and unlimited api access plan on your website right which are billed at 300000 and 60000 so uh, how many users would we have who are taking these plans so uh, nearly all of our customer is on the subscription basis which is basically your uh, um your uh, user way user base pricing which is basically you know, your single user starts with like a 6600 dollars to uh, 13000 to you know more than 20000 based on as the number of users increase most of it is platform subscription we also have a api plan for some uh, investors who want to build sort of you know their proprietary models on top of the data uh, so we do uh, and this is at a higher price point so we do have some customers but i would uh, you know say of the overall revenue this would be a small percentage right so so the, these would be uh, what uh, low double digits something like 10 20 customers or just to get a sense of i mean yes uh, there would be low yes there should be low be double digits single, digit, single, single, single high single or to low double okay and, uh, and and just to understand this uh, this this customers and users added so i mean this 32 and 26 number we see right so is it more of a function that the gross additions were higher but the churn sort of pulled down this number or is it that the gross addition itself were lower so uh, i think uh, it might be uh, it is probably a function of that uh, if so if you compare on a year on year basis so if you compare to the same period uh, last year the increment would have been slightly slower as you can see which is also in line with the revenue in you know, sort of the quarter that you see on the quarters um so and uh, so so i think it would be a combination of the gross addition uh there would be a little bit of uh, you know sort of a de decrease in the existing but i think that the number is sort of fairly uh, you know uh, sort of close in that sense so even if the downgrade that would happen it would be a very small number is my sense if if that yeah. answers the question yeah so no i i didn't get that properly so is it uh, so just to give an example is it like the gross additions are 70 80 and the net is 32 or is it like close enough the gross and the net that's what i'm trying to understand my my sense is that uh, uh, gross additions would be higher and then net additions would be lower that would be the case because new acquisitions uh, have been following a similar pattern there is sure that has not significantly changed in that, from what i know sure sure and and uh, so you mentioned about the increase in asp right but uh, if i see your sort of a uh, transparent pricing on your website uh, the the per user cost and even some of the other group cost have not changed significantly right so first question is sort of what is the driver for the increase in asp and second uh, at least for you know the medium term 2 3 years how do you sort of think about pricing sure so the asp the realized pricing that you see is per account uh, what that corresponds to is uh, one or more users if you look at the user wide user wide asp that is only marginally changed from like you know 2.3 to nearly 2.4 if you look at the asp per account that is changed from 6.5 uh, lakh to 6.9 if you look at last financial year and if you look at the latest quarter right uh, so uh, the increase in that is basically based on it can be that you know uh, the uh, you are the existing accounts are sort of upgrading 
right so it can be that uh, the existing accounts are buying more users that is why your uh, you know asp realized pricing uh, per account would actually increase that is one uh, to give you a small example so for instance the number of accounts for, uh, that pay us say more than 40 lakh that would have doubled it's on a slightly more than double it's on a small pace but you know that gives us a trend across all these price movement we are also seeing upgrades that has happened and that's the uh, reason for this movement uh the second point is on you know how do we see this going forward uh, so uh, we don't uh, you know, so the trend that we have seen is that a lot of the incoming customers typically start small and grow over time so my sense is that you will not see a lot of uh, you know in uh, sort of increase within that that happens it will probably be range bound it will probably you know increase marginally but it will be range bound because a lot of the incoming customers actually start small and the uh, the older ones sort of grow over time no no uh, my question is more on the absolute pricing per seat over time at least at the medium term next 2 3 years so currently we don't plan to do any price revision uh, or a price increase or a user based price increase immediately we might reconsider that uh, you know probably next year uh, one of the reason is that for us the uh, the cost to serve incremental customer is very minimal so we are also focusing a lot on Uh, you know sort of uh, making more and more people familiar with that so you know like selling to more number of users increases the more number of licenses within the existing accounts rather than increasing the user pricing sure sure that's helpful and just a final question on language so so uh, you mentioned some of the initiatives right uh, on on going into newer geographies and so on so is our platform solving for language uh, uh for 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 different languages or are we sort of focusing on uh english focused geographies first so our platform is actually so that's an interesting question our platform is actually global so two things one is we have coverage of companies across different countries which includes many non english speaking as well so you can if you want to look at if if there's an investor in say germany who wants to look at german based companies through the platform you know they are able to do that uh or in any other one so we have coverage of companies you know across all the countries uh that's one the second thing is that even uh for instance like we do uh, we um, we also have regulatory filings like we capture a lot of regulatory filings of these private companies there also a lot of the filings are available in non english speaking a uh, non english uh, language for instance wherein we are able to do language translation we are able to standardize this data right so i would say both on the data front as well as on the additional like uh, you know regulatory data front we capture companies and data which is uh, from non english uh, languages as well sure that that's very helpful thank you and best of luck next question is from uh, ayush vimal ayush please go ahead yeah thanks for taking my question hi neha uh, you know i just wanted to understand uh, you know qualitatively what are the key reasons why you know we are experiencing a 25% churn rate what are the key reasons why probably customers drop out at the time of renewal sure right so if you look at the uh, the uh, the customer sort of retention that has been broadly across the last three financial year that has probably been in the same range you know last year it was close to 74% probably been in a similar range by number across the last three financial year uh just a point to note this is by number and this is not by revenue we'll probably give the revenue uh, you know also later point in time uh but this is just a num- by number how many customers basically uh, you know are there and uh, renew is amul renew which is there and how many renew in that year uh there are a couple of reasons why this may this may happen uh you know why uh, this is at this percentage one is uh you know to talk about the top three reasons so one is Uh, there might be some peripheral customers that we might acquire which uh, you know for which it is not a continuous use case for instance if there is a corporate that we acquire which is a smaller corporate who's doing mna for instance you know within this year and may not have an active mna team uh, you know for them it may be a, like a one year kind of a uh, uh, use case right so that can be one user because we do not do uh, because a lot of our conversion is actually inbound we are also attracting these sort of customer segments right that's one the second thing is uh, the second thing can be ki, you know we uh, they are looking for uh, or you know sometimes they say that uh, or sometimes they just starting to use the platform right so for instance bulk of the customers uh, more than 50% of the customers that we acquire haven't used any platform before that so that's the typical second reason that we uh, that we see that people are dif- different phases of the uh, usage adoption cycle 
so some people have been able to figure out some people you know may not be able uh, are not able to sort of start using it after one or two quarters that's the second third is small reason uh, small reason might be that you know sometimes they are looking at coverage in a particular industry or a geography we may not have at that time and you know sometimes what we do is that we uh, sort of also track them and whenever in the next two to three quarters when we have the coverage in that industry we go back to that customers right so these are the top three reasons and interestingly in our case it's not that uh, you know uh, uh, we are also able to acquire a lot of customers that we uh, that uh, you know we lose uh, because uh, the data is sort of fairly unique and whenever we have sort of better coverage or uh, we have a better use case we also go back to them so uh, thanks and, and does this number uh, does this churn number also include uh, customers that we've probably acquired to give a free trial to and and some of those customers who you know who who drop off or we don't include that number in the overall customer accounts we don't include that this is only paid this is only people that would have had any sort of paid billing in any financial year got it uh, another question that i had you know the idea of asking this question is to really understand how truly global uh, we are from a customer perspective uh, you have a sense and i i know you won't have an exact number but you have a sense of you know the the proportion within the 70% international revenue of clients who are you know taking traction solely to analyze opportunities outside india Yeah, so that's a great question. So uh, for us, bulk of the users that are situated in a particular geography are using it to find companies within that geography, right? So because uh, you, so there are two types of investors. So typically, even if you look at India, there are a lot of India dedicated investors. Plus, there is a few large global investors. You know, maybe uh, the large late stage funds which are investing across geographies. Uh, but most of the investors are actually they raise funds for investment in the particular geography only by the mandate. right so most of the people that we work with say in uk or in germany or in us are typically looking at local data only from the platform so most of the customers that we would have are actually looking at uh, data of the local company and you can also see that spread on the data on our platform like even if you look at the spread of companies which is there on the platform is actually you know across all these countries And, uh, and just one last question. Uh, you know, the pace of uh, customer accounts increase over the last nine months has been fairly subdued. So you feel uh, that you know this is primarily because the funding winter that's around, or or do you think uh, probably this can be taken as a sustainable rate going forward? So there is obviously a little bit of slowdown if you compare to last year and this year. But you know, uh, we think that obviously this can be uh, more. and uh, we are actively that's why working on all these initiatives that you see on the marketing front on the on the conversion front etc that we continue to do and uh, you know we obviously think that you know this can uh, become much faster sure thanks that's it thanks ayush uh, you know uh, we'll probably take one or two more questions from the q and a box that are pending there are a lot more questions there but what i would request uh, um people is to basically reach out to neha abhishek and team or to us and uh, we will ensure that some of those unanswered questions uh, get responses um so we'll just take one or two from the q and a box and, and and request everyone to reach out after the call given that we are running over time um so um neha and abhishek there is one question which has been um, asked by multiple people and it's more basically to understand you know the trajectory of uh, revenue growth and uh, ebitda margins um in the near term in fi24 how do they think about what we are uh, you know targeting even if you don't intend to give a guidance but otherwise just to understand uh, you know how that could potentially look like and is it panning out the way in which uh, you had anticipated it say even a couple of quarters ago sure i'll take that question so essentially in terms of the ebitda margin we think that this business is a fairly high margin business uh, yeah, which you can see probably from the profile of you know any uh, some of the large financial data platforms that exist either for other seg- uh, like for the public markets or other data subscription platforms which exist we believe that you know because we also have the cost arbitrage uh, you know difference which is there because we are sort of you know based in india and then selling data globally we should ideally aspire for a higher margin than some of the other uh, you know uh, sort of platforms so on a uh, comparable there's no comparable which is there you know on a india basis but there are companies similar companies which is there you know overseas which can be sort of one indicative of what is the kind of margins that you can aspire for 
right that's one on the margin side the other thing on for our business the way to look at it uh, so to give a margin is might be difficult but the way to look at it is you know how much um given a, the revenue trajectory how much of the incremental revenue will continue to go into bottom line right so that we aspire that that should again uh, that should be bulk of it by bulk i mean like more than 50% within the next 2 to 3 quarters hope that answers the question fair enough i think uh, this is good enough we are already 15 minutes uh, over time so uh, we will wrap this up and uh, thank you so much neha and abhishek for giving us the opportunity to host the call uh, i'll just pass it on to you guys uh, for any kind of closing remarks thank you yeah thanks a lot rishi and thanks everyone for joining us today i hope you had a good understanding of uh, the recent business update as well as we've been able to answer some of the queries that you have uh, you know please if you have any follow up questions please do reach out to any of us Uh, I am uh, at Neha at Traction dot com, or you can reach out to Abhishek or Prashant, or you can write to our team at Investor Relations, Investor dot Relations at Traction dot com. Um, thanks again for joining us, and uh, you know, hope you have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Recording stopped.